صلى الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير رب اشرح لي صدري ويحسن لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين وصلاة والسلام وتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي اسمه في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطحرين سيما أولهم أمير المؤمنين وآخرهم بقية الله في الأرضين روه وعرواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ورحمة الله على محبيهم ومواليهم وشيعتهم أجمعين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم وقتليهم وغاسب حقوقهم ومنكري فضائلهم ملعونين أما بعد قال المعصوم عليه السلام من كان بازلا محجتا وموطنا على لقاء الله فليرحل معنا إني راحل مصبحا إن شاء الله For the happiness of Hazrat Zahra Marziya For the enlightenment of the graves of your marhumin Of the graves of the shuhada, ulama and siddiqeen for the safety of the followers of Ahlul Bayt around the world and for the safety and the hastening of the reappearance of Hazrat Baqiyatillah al-A'zam arwahun al-Fida please recite your loudest salawat All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who is Rahman and the one who is Rahim the one that has given us once again the opportunity to sit in the remembrance of Aba Abdullah, to sit in that majlis that many have died for, many have craved, that majlis that even the Malaika descend in order to listen to it, in order to partake in the Aza of Aba Abdullah. That individual that every Nabi, every Wali from the start of time spoke of his Musibah and each and every one of them wept over his difficulties and now we have been given that opportunity to sit and remember and mourn this individual and what an individual it is that we mourn what an imam it is that we have that in Khasa'is al Husayniya, Shaykh Ja'far Shushtari, he compares the blessings of Imam al Husayn with the blessings of the heavens. He says, and he gives many comparisons, but I've highlighted a few of them. And those of you that have access to the book Khasa'is al Husayniya, you can go and check it there yourselves as to what exactly are those blessings that Aba Abdullah has been bestowed with that so many people from so many different walks of life are attracted towards the cause of Imam al Hussein, are attracted towards the Musibah of Imam al Hussein? He says that the sky is the place for dua to be accepted. Your duas are raised and they go towards the skies to be accepted. But Hussein's name is the reason why duas are accepted. Every Nabi has used his name in the time of difficulty in order to have their du'as accepted. He says the sky is the place of dhikr of the malaika that they say subhanallah, they say alhamdulillah, they say mashaAllah. But he says that Karbala too had a zikr. Its zikr was inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Its zikr was wa akha wa 
Abata, wa Husayna, that every single shaheed going out would cry out to Aba Abdullah and he would reach their bodies and say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He says that those cries of those shuhada in Karbala that were crying out, wa akha, wa Aba Abdullah, those cries are greater at the level of ubudiyah, at the level of servitude, at the level of submission, than all of the dhikr of the malaika of the heavens. He says the sky is the place where the anbiya go for mi'raj, but Karbala is that place of the mi'raj of the malaika, that they descend down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the event of Karbala until now, has stationed 70,000 malaika that circumambulates the grave of Aba Abdullah. And every day, another 70,000 are sent down in order to circumambulate the grave of Imam Al Hussein. 140,000 malaika encircle his grave every single day. He says that that is the greatness of Aba Abdullah, that in the skies there is heaven in Karbala there are those whose blood with whose blood heaven was made he says that Karbala is heaven upon earth those for whom heaven was made are in Karbala and it is through the blood of those that were in Karbala those that gave their blood in Karbala that sinners like us reach our salvation. It is through their blood, through their sacrifice, that we reach our salvation. That we have our sins forgiven. We shed a tear for Abba Abdullah and all our sins are wiped away. This is the lowest level that you shed one tear for Imam al Hussein. Your sins are forgiven. But then the higher level is man baka ala al Hussein. Arifan bihaqqihi wajibat lahu al Jannah. There is a level higher than just shedding a tear. It says that there are those that who do buka about Imam over Imam al Hussein. They cry loudly. In another narration, it says not just the one that cries, the one that makes them cry, and the one that is unable to cry, but at the very least, he makes the face that he is crying. Arifan wajibat lahu al Jannah. Knowing the right of Imam al Hussein. Saying, Wajibat lahul Jannah, then Jannah becomes wajib upon him. When he understands what Imam al Hussein stood for, not just cries for Imam al Hussein, the base level is he hears the musibah, he cries, his sins are forgiven. The higher level is that he now understands why Imam al Hussein went to Karbala. He understands the purpose of Imam al Hussein. He understands why the Imam gave those sacrifices. He understands the aims and the purposes and the objectives of Imam al Hussein. Then when he understands them, here's his musibah, does buka, or makes the face of one that is sad trying to cry wajibat lahul jannah jannah becomes wajib upon him but the requirement is that he understands the right of imam al hussein he understands the purpose we go back to yesterday's example that the narration is in al Hussein Misba al Huda wa Safinatun Naja. That Hussein is the lantern of guidance and the ark of salvation. But he is only the ark of salvation if we choose to embark upon the ark. Instead, if we stand outside and sing about how beautiful this ark is. 
If we stand outside and we say, look how beautiful it's made, look how quickly it can save us. But yet we still don't want to do what Imam al Hussein wanted from us. Same. We cry for him without understanding why he stood in Karbala, why he gave a child like Ali al Asghar, why he gave a son like Ali Akbar. in order to take us upon the greatest journey. The journey to meet with Allah. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy that we still had Dua Kumail today, on Thursday night. Generally what happens in our Husayni is that Muharram comes and then we say, okay, you know what, maybe you know, we haven't got time for Salat al Jama'at, people get tired. We haven't got time for Dua Kumail, people get tired. And so we put all of these things that we re usually associate with not you know, the days of Muharram aside. But it is a good thing that we recognize and you understand that this Dua Kumail, this Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb that you took part in, these hands that you raised, these tears that you shed, that was the purpose of Karbala. That was the very purpose of Imam al Hussein. Man kana bazilan muhjata wa muwattinan ala liqa illah, fal yarhal ma'ana inni rahilun musbihan, inshaAllah. Those of you that have made the firm intention to spend your blood in our way, he says leaving Mecca, and have made the intention to meet with Allah, then come with me because I am leaving in the morning. I said yesterday that hundreds surrounded him in Mecca until he told them this was a one-way journey. Then only a handful joined him. And we want to analyze over the coming night this concept of liqa Allah. How does one meet with Allah? By tackling various aspects of our lives. To see if we can just make the minutest of change, but yet ascend so much closer towards Allah. You see individuals that are praying salah after salah, 60 years, 50 years, 30 years of their life. They haven't missed a single salah, but yet when you see all of the narrations about the one that is regular in his salah, the one that is regular in his fasting, and you see that they will have this ability, they will be given this blessing by Allah, but you see us praying 20, 30 years, but no difference, no change in our life. Why is it that Asaf al-Barkhiya can have a little knowledge of the Holy Quran and he can bring the throne of Bilqis in the blink of an eye? But me, or a little knowledge of the book of his time, he can bring the throne of Bilqis in the blink of an eye. But yet me, with the Qur'an, with the teachings of the Imams, with Nahjul Balagha, with Sahifatul Sajjadiyya, I still am the same. How is it that I listen to Dua Kumail and I'm raising my hands and I'm saying, my Lord, have mercy upon the weak body, upon my weak body, upon my thin skin. Have mercy upon my frailty. How is it possible that I'm raising my hands in Dua Kumail and I'm saying, my Lord, I can't take the difficulties of this world, yet they are short, they are not very long, they are not very difficult. How will I take the difficulties of the Akhara? How will I take the difficulties of hell? How will I take those difficulties that are long? But yet I can't shed a tear. Because there is no ma'rifah. 
There is no understanding of whom I raise my hands in front of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith of Mi'raj, He says one thing to the Holy Prophet, He says that I'm shocked at three groups of my Abd. The first is that Abd of mine, that servant of mine, he enters to pray his salah. He understands who he is standing in front of and who he is raising his hands in front of. But yet, he's inattentive. Allahu Akbar. Oh, yeah, that's where I left my keys. Yeah, after I finish this. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do this and that and Allah Subhanahu Rabbi and my mind is elsewhere. Or then, God forbid, come the time of Fajr and I'm half asleep. You know what's happening? And sometimes, you know, there is a saying. It's not a hadith. Sometimes it's wrongly reported as a hadith. Salatu mi'raj al mu'min. Sometimes we take it literally that the Holy Prophet went, he saw everything in the heavens, he saw all of that, came back and his bed was still warm. <laughs> Sometimes at the time of Fajr, you see people shoot out, do wudu, pray namaz, come back, bed still warm. <laughs> we take it literally, as salatu mi'raj al say, okay. So the Prophet went, he saw all of that, came back, bed was still warm. <laughs> I want to go, go my mi'raj and bed is still warm. Yet that is the time for dua. That is the time that the malaika of mercy are descending. But yet, I'm inattentive, unaware, ghafil, the whole world around me. But yet, I don't even know whether my Lord is happy with me. The second group that Allah says, He says, that abd that laughs and is happy. But yet he's unaware whether I'm happy with him or not. And the third, that abd of mine that has his rizq and his food today, yet he's still worried about tomorrow. He can't sleep at night. How am I going to pay the bills? What am I going to eat? My children, what are they going to do? He's saying, I gave it to you today. And you're worried about tomorrow? I've been giving it to you for 20, 30, 40 years of your life. And still you're worried about tomorrow. You're so absorbed and consumed by this fear of tomorrow. That you hoard. That you gather. That you plan. Such that you forget that one day you have to die. One day you have to answer for everything that you have done within your life. One day you have to meet him. And there are in two states that you can stand in front of your Lord. In one state that you're biting your knuckles wishing. Ya laytani kumtu turaba. How I wish today I was earth. Or then in the other state that the malaika salute. That the malaika welcome. That there is no test, there is no questioning. There are two states an individual can meet with his Lord. And there are those in this world that see their Lord everywhere. Because they understand, they have that ma'rifah. When they pray, they understand that prayer. They understand who they are in front of. We want to liqa Allah. We want to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are stages that an individual has to go through in order to meet with his Lord. The first of those stages is tark dunya To let go, to move away, to reject the world. Now by tark dunya I don't mean that everyone starts wearing sackcloths and goes and lives in the cave somewhere and doesn't want to interact with the whole of society. No. 
Talk al dunya. In that way, you know, people there are in front of Amirul Mu'mineen and they're raising, and we have this paradox in that Jul Balagha. That's where at one point he's saying, Oh, dunya, I am divorcing you three times. Ya dunya ghurri ghayri. Oh, dunya, go and deviate someone else. Go and try and uh, dis um, persuade someone else. Ali is not to be persuaded. And then at another time, someone is in front of him saying, How disgusting, how horrible is this dunya? And he's admonishing him, saying, Why are you saying this about the dunya? Do you not know that this is the benefit of the dunya? This is the benefit of the dunya. We have that paradox. How do we understand it? We go to the words of Amir al Mu'mini. Because this is Zu'ad, ascetism. That an individual, what is Zuhd? That we say that Isa had Zuhd and Ali possessed the Zuhd of Isa. Amir al Mu'mineen says Zuhd is not possessing anything. It is not not owning anything. Instead, it is that nothing owns you. It is that nothing owns you. This is Zuhd. That is Tarq dunya that you're not tied down to this world that when you hit the stone of your grave then you realize in order to meet with Allah we need to be not we need to be in a state that we are not attached to this world we have money one day alhamdulillah we don't have any money the next day, Alhamdulillah. We were bestowed with children, Alhamdulillah. Allah took away those children, Alhamdulillah. This is difficult. This is what we learn from Karbala. It is that Turk dunya that enabled those individuals to come and stand with Imam al Hussein. Otherwise, you see that Imam is going to Amr ibn Sa'ad saying, what are you doing? Join us. He says, I know you're on truth. And Imam, this is one of those individuals that Imam visits on a couple of occasions. And then another one of the companions of the Imam goes to visit him as well. Imam says to him, come. He says, Imam, I have family in Kufa. He says, we'll give them protection. He says, I have property in Kufa. Imam says, we will give you property. He says, I'll lose wealth. He says, we will make you wealthy. Come and join us. Then he says, Imam, but they have offered me the governorship of Ray. He says, we can't offer you that. But we can offer you Jannah. He says, no. And he never reached that governorship. They had the opportunity to meet with Allah. But they chose to reject it. They chose to turn away from it. We have the opportunity to meet with Allah. Do we reject that opportunity every time it's presented? If we look at our own lives, it's the time of Salah. And I'm like, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And then, oh, 20 minutes before Maghrib. Quickly, Dhuhr and Asr. As quick as possible. And still I have the desire to meet with Allah. That I'm constantly late to meet Him. I still have that desire where the sixth Imam is saying, Imtahanu Shi'atana Inda Thalat, Inda Mawaqita Salah, Kaifa Muhafida Tahum. That test our Shi'as at three times. The first time, test them at the time of Salah. See how they maintain that time. See how they preserve that time. If they are doing anything else, they're not from us. Because our Shi'as are the ones that as soon as the time sets in, 
They are there praying in front of their Lord. This is laqa Allah. In the riwayat concerning Hazrat Dawood, there comes a narration where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Dawood, He says, Ya Dawood, I have created the hearts of those who long for me from my satisfaction, from my happiness. And I have blessed them with light upon their faces. Hazrat Dawood says, Ilahi, what characteristics did these individuals possess? That they have been blessed by you. Their faces have been illuminated by you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, the first thing Dawood, بِحُسْنِذًا They have good opinion about people. Anyone who comes to them, they have a good opinion about them. They don't, they don't instantly think, why is this person talking to me? What is he doing? You know, there's something going. Or they see someone, you know, going somewhere or passing by somewhere that they shouldn't be passing by. And not thinking maybe 70 excuses, whatever, you don't know. No. Oh, what's he doing in there? You know, what's he doing in there? Or someone speaks to me in a way that is not acceptable maybe because they were distracted and it offends me. And so for the rest of my life I hold a grudge against them. Or someone doesn't come to my kid's wedding and so then now we're not going to their wedding until the end of days. Not thinking maybe they had a problem. He says that to those that have been illuminated by me, they have good opinion of the people. They give people chances, that opportunity. And they refrain from the dunya and its people. They stay away from the dunya and its people. Not just the dunya. It says, and its people. And those that are drowned in that love of the dunya. There is the aspect throughout the du'as of Ahlul Bayt that you will find that talks about the company that we keep and how much effect that company has upon us. You pick up, for example, Dua Abu Hamza Thumali, where Allah Subhanahu wa uh, where the Imam is saying that, my Lord, I don't know what it is. Every time I make that intention to stand in front of you and pray, you cast sleep upon me. My Lord, I don't know what it is. Every time I want to do munajat, the opportunity never avails. I don't know what it is when I feel my inner self becoming more inclined towards you. Something happens that pushes me away from you. Or when I find that my gatherings are becoming the gatherings of the tawabin, of those that remember you, those that repent in front of you. Something happens and I'm pushed away from them. They say, Sayyidi la'allaka an ba'abika taradtani. My Lord, maybe it is because you've expelled me from your door. Wa'an khidmatika na'aytani. And you have expelled me and removed me from your servitude. Then the Imam lists 14 reasons. Maybe it is because you found me amongst the liars. Maybe it is because you found me not fond of the gathering of the scholars. Maybe it is because you found me amongst the wrongdoers. Every single one that the Imam lists is about the company that we keep. And on the other side, in Munajat al-Arifin, when Imam is speaking about the Arafa and the characteristics of the Arafa, he doesn't say, Oh Allah, make me an 
Arif. Instead, he says, Oh Allah, place me amongst those individuals who the trees of yearning for you have taken root in their chest. Oh Allah, place me amongst those who, in front of whose eyes the curtains of the unseen have been lifted. He refers to company over and over. Here Allah is saying, it's not just enough to do tarq dunya It's not just enough to say, I'm not attached to this dunya. At the same time, I'm not attached to its people. If my friends are those, that's all they ever talk about, is hustling and getting rich and making money, that will inevitably have its effects upon me. If they're there selling drugs or they're taking part in haram, even if they are the Shias of Ali Muhammad or claim to be, distance from them is essential because they will take you to hell and the Holy Quran says it. That there will be a group of people that will come on the day of judgment and they will be being dragged towards hell. And they will say, Ya Laytani, oh how I wish that I hadn't taken Fulan as my friend. Lam attakhaz Fulan and Khalila. Oh, how I wish this individual wasn't my friend, that now because of him I'm being dragged to hell. Allah says that those who I have created that enlightenment for them, they distance themselves from the world, i.e. they're not attached to it. And they distance themselves from the people of the world. They enjoy seclusion with me. They like to sit in solitude in front of Allah in the middle of the night, in Shah Ramadan, in Rajab, in Shaban, in every single month, every single day. They have a time where they allocate for seclusion with me. I don't know whether you have it here in London because your mosques are like less than, I don't think you have any masjids here, but uh, at least from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's maybe one or two here. Right. Anyway, I'tikaf is one of the recommended actions during Shah Ramadan. And those of you that have had the opportunity or have not had the opportunity, try and find somewhere that you can go and do I'tikaf, even if it's not in Shah Ramadan. There's a masjid that you can do it. This is that seclusion, that solitude. And you see many people, they're afraid of this solitude with Allah. They're very happy to recite dua, they're very happy to recite salah on time. But you say to them, come and live in the masjid for three days. Don't talk about worldly affairs for three days. You don't need to pray the whole three days. You can just sit there in solitude, in quiet. You can have Islamic discussions, but you can't speak about the world. And just do what you normally do, pray and you, know, and you fast during the day. See how many people will walk away from Eritakaf and be like, no, 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 I can't do that. That desire for solitude is not there. He says they have the desire and they seclude themselves for me. And they take part in munajat with me. They converse with me. Munajat is different to dua. It doesn't need to be recited in Arabic. It's just that you sit and you speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about your problems, about your difficulties, about how much He has helped you already and how audacious you have been already asking more and more, though we do not deserve it. Acknowledging my insignificance in front of Allah. He says they do munajat. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Dawood, and know that no one will reach any of these points before these four points, or these five points. Meaning that it's not that you can just go straight away and say, right, now I'm going to have a good opinion of everyone and I'm going to do munajat every night and I'm going to seclude myself every night and I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, distance myself from this individual, distance myself from this world. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it's not that easy. Because an individual has spent their whole life forgetting Allah. Then they all of a sudden want to turn and go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because things have just got a little difficult in their life. Says, no, it's not that easy. And many a times we go through these phases where we get this sort of religiosity within us. That we start feeling more religious, more inclined towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so then we, we sort of go forward and we start reciting this tasbih, that salah, salatul layl, recite this dua, this mustahab, that mustahab, do it, do it, do it. We do it for about two days, three days, third day. We're like, forget this, this is not worth it. <laughs> not worth it. And then slowly but surely I start reducing, 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 until I'm back to where I was. Why is that? Just as a side point, why is that? It's because we haven't understood our souls. And in the later lecture, we will speak about the, the soul and the various powers that are there within it. And we'll give more of a, uh, an understanding and an in-depth discussion on it there. But why is it the soul is like a muscle? The example I give is the soul is like a muscle. You don't turn up to the gym and start lifting 120 kgs or start deadlifting, you know, 150 kilos because you'll slip a disc. Or if you manage to do it, what happens? You do it that day, you feel great. Do a couple of reps. The next day you're like, can't move. Or you're walking around, the arms sort of... Uh, obviously brothers will get this, sisters, if it doesn't make any sense, I apologize. Uh, but you know, arms and you can't straighten your arms because you've got the DOMS, you know, delayed onset of muscle soreness. And so I walk here and they say, well, why have I got that? Thank you. Why have I got that? I said, because your muscle wasn't ready for it. So because you put it under all that strain, all of a sudden, it's locked itself up in order to protect itself from any further craziness that you may have in your mind. The soul is the same. It's not trained to do long nights of ibadat. It's not trained to do it because we've never done it. Then all of a sudden I get this religious feeling and then I start staying up the whole night praying this namaz and that salah and going up for the whole of Laylatul Qadr. And the next day I'm like, oh, I can't wake up. I shouldn't have stayed up for Laylatul Qadr. I'm so tired because my soul is saying to me, look, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> Where did this new thing come from? And that's what we do. The soul needs to be trained. It is inclined towards evil, so not evil, towards its animalistic self, towards what it was made for, towards its base survival instincts of desire, of anger, of imagination. It's inclined towards them. It's going to go that way. The intellect is what controls it. But if that soul has been allowed to run wild for so many years, then all of a sudden you try to bring it down to Urbudiyah. You try to bring it to servitude. And it's like, look, I was free until now. And now you want to enslave me. And so what it starts doing, it starts saying to you, look, I can't do this. I'm tired. What do you mean you only need four hours of sleep? We'll come to that in the later nights. What do you mean I shouldn't eat this much? We'll come to that as well in the later night. And your soul will begin to reject. It will begin to tell you, no, no, you're crazy. What are you doing? And then it will try and find ways out. Like we have in Shah Ramadan, where people are like, ah, uh, you know, we can re reduce it or not even reduce it. They're like, okay, you know, uh, in order to stop you from feeling so hungry, 
eat this food in the morning, eat this food in the morning, eat this food, have these many, this many carbs, you have this, 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 and it will keep you fuller for longer. Everyone's seen that, and it goes around on Facebook all the time. Everyone has seen that, right? It's just me. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. <laughs> So you see that, and then they're like, eat this vegetable, eat that vegetable, it'll keep you fuller for longer, it'll keep you satiated for longer. But here's the bombshell or the news flash, and that is the whole purpose of fasting, is that you must feel the hunger. But our souls has told, have told us, no, 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 look, look, this hunger thing is bad. Though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, my abd is closest to me when he is hungry. But our soul is saying to us, no, 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 look, eat, eat, eat. And inshallah, in the later nights, we have one specifically, a lecture specifically about this. But how is it that these individuals can achieve this husn of zan, this tarqid dunya, this munajat, this desire for solitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that no one, O Dawood, will reach this until they do they until they reject the dunya and its people again allah reiterates it you have to make that intention to reject the dunya and its people in for it for turkey dunya to take root he says it won't come to anyone except those who reject the dunya and its people those that do not occupy themselves with anything of it or its remembrance they're not chasing it constantly because the dunya has a number of um, ways that it has been referred to the third thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to that in the short time that I have left he says they don't occupy themselves in the remembrance of the dunya worrying about it thinking what am I gonna do how am I gonna survive what's gonna happen to me what's gonna happen to my children because they don't bother themselves, they don't stress themselves out. They devote their hearts to me. None will be able to achieve those first five attributes unless they devote their hearts to me. And they choose me over all my creation. We often say Allah is the most important thing. Or sometimes now we have this sort of problem where at times people start to raise the Imams higher than Allah and so we can take this on that level as well that's those that have those traits that Allah they choose Allah first over everything when it's time to pray they pray doesn't matter who they are with or where they are if they can find a suitable place to pray they pray. They choose Allah over all His creations. But this whole dunya has been created in order to pull us towards, to test us. Because when we fight against it, it's very difficult. Tazkir to nafs is very difficult. Purification of the soul is very difficult. If anyone ever tells you purification of the soul is easy, it is not. The single most difficult moment in a person's life, most painful moment in a person's life is dying. But this cure to nafs, purification of the soul, Allah says in the hadith of Mi'raj, that all of mankind die at least once in their life. But Ahlul Akhirah, the people of the Akhirah, the people of Allah, they die every single day, 70 times a day. Fighting their nafs. Fighting your nafs is more difficult than dying. And this world has been created in order to test you. If you can fight against that nafs, you refine yourself and you ascend closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the whole purpose of Karbala. Inshallah, the remaining topic, we'll talk about it tomorrow. My time is up. This is why 
This is what Karbala is all about. That Abu Abdullah stands in the plains of Karbala. He says, Anas Abidu Dunya wa Deen Laikun ala al Sinatim. He says, Man is a slave of this world, and the religion is but a taste on his tongue. When it suits him, he keeps it. When it does not suit him, kalla dayanun. When it does not suit him, when he thinks that I don't agree with this beard, or she thinks I don't agree with this hijab, or he thinks that I don't agree with praying, then the religion is no, no more needed. But when he feels passionately about something like Azar, or he feels something very passionately about something like Salah, then that's fine, it's okay, because it can fit into his lifestyle until the moment someone tells him, look, you can't pray in your job, you're gonna have to wait. Now that comes, there's the test. At that time, very few of them are really. Yesterday we spoke about Abu Abdullah's leaving Medina, his going to the grave of Rasulullah, his going to the grave of his mother Fatima. And it's difficult for any individual to leave their home. But yet an individual that takes his family members knowing full well what is about to befall them. How difficult was it for Abu Abdullah? How difficult was it for him to know what was to happen and still embark upon that journey for the sake of Allah? That Medina that held so many memories of his grandfather and that Medina that held so many sorrows that Medina where he saw his father Ali leave and go towards Kufa that Medina that he had to return towards after Amir al-Mu'mineen had been killed And him seeing at every point that Ali is going through the pangs of death and he is standing there, Abu Abdullah begins crying. All of the children of Amirul Mu'mineen, they begin crying. Amirul Mu'mineen turns to Abu Abdullah, he says, Hussein, you, you don't cry. Because your day is far more difficult than anyone else's day. Hussein, you don't cry. That Medina where he sees his brother Hassan suffering from the effects of the poison coursing through his body. That now Hassan calls for a tray to be brought. It's put in front of him. Imam al-Hassan begins vomiting. Parts of the liver of Imam al-Hassan are coming. And yet Abu Abdullah viewing this crying, Imam al-Hassan says, Hussein, don't cry. <laughs> you don't cry, Hussein, because your day is more difficult. Today the poison is coursing through my body, but you are by my side. But there will be a time when Shimmer will fire a three-headed poisoned arrow into your chest. That will exit from your back and you will pull it and the blood will begin to flow from your chest and you will take that blood Bismillah wa billah wa ala millat rasulillah and you will pour it upon your face Hussein you don't cry that Hussein is preparing he is leaving Medina but with him is his sister Zainab she says I too am coming with you and as Zainab now prepares to leave Ali Akbar comes forward Qasim comes forward Abu Abdullah, Imam Sajjad, they all come forward in order to help Zainab mount upon her ride. But yet this same Zainab, she left all of Medina with all her family members around. But this same Zainab, 
when she returned some short months after back to that Medina, she looked at the walls, said, Ya Medina, to Jaddina la taqbalina. Oh Medina of my grandfather, do not accept us. Because when we left, we had our men with us. But now we return, there is no one with us. That Zainab that has seen the difficulties of Sham, the difficulties of Kufa. Now she returns to Medina. That Medina that she left with surrounded by 18 brothers. That Medina that she left surrounded by her nephews. Now she returns alone to the grave of the Holy Prophet and says, Oh my grandfather, if there had not been any Namahrams around, Zainab would show you what the ropes of charm have done. Hala la alatullah ala al qawm al dhalimin wa sa'alam al ladina dhalamu in yum qalabin yum qalibun inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun ma